Okay. We talk what you can do without being conscious. Now, uh, it is a tourism today in, um, in today's culture that uh, much of what goes on in our head is unconscious. This is, of course, this is a new realization in, West, in the Western um, intellectual thought tradition. It's really Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, who sort of first, um, I mean, he, he wasn't the first, strictly speaking, to talk about unconscious processing, but he's the one sort of who made it a major part of, of his philosophy, um, if you read some of it, such as it is, that um, unconscious drives and urges and motivations, um, particularly in, this, in his case with respect to, um, with regard to, um, uh, Christianity in the church um, has po have very powerful and uh, mainly, to, as he sees it, negative influences on um, on um, on life in general. So he introduced he introduced really the concept. Of course, then it is really Sigmund Freud to whom we own the idea of uh, the unconscious. And of course, he constructed an entire hierarchy of various types of unconscious. There's the preconscious, there's unconscious, and there is um, subconscious. And he's, you know, has elaborate theoretical arguments, sort of, to understand the relationship between the pre, the sub, and the unconscious, and as, as, as compared to the conscious. And of course, he has all these mythological creatures like a Oedipus complex and the id and the super ego and all of those things, which really have been almost have been basically have not proven uh, their worth in terms of objective criteria. So we don't talk about them anymore today in science, but, but nonetheless, Freud remains a very powerful influence. I'm, uh, I'm co-organizing next year a big conference on consciousness in Tucson, and half the people want to organize a symposium on Freud and the unconscious, and what has Freud taught us about the dreams, about dreaming and all of that, which I think is very little. He was a little bit too much sex-obsessed, of course, also. Um, but it is true that there's enormous amount of... Um, there's an enormous amount of unconscious processing going on in the brain. So in that sense, Freud was onto something. Of course, Freud himself was a very smart guy, there's no question about it. He himself was a neuroscientist. He got his um, MD working on um, uh, single neurons. In fact, at the time, you might, you might know, some of you at least, that at the time when he did this in the 70s and 80s, 1870, 1880, the neuron theory was, the neuron doctrine was still very controversial and there was still a toss up, a fight between those people who thought that the nervous system consists out of this reticula, out of this continuous sheet of, of, of entities, of, of neurons, we would say today, um, this reticular net, this sort of continuous network, and those people who said that just like anywhere else in biology, the cell, the, the neuron is the basic unit of the nervous system. That wasn't established till around then. He co himself contributed to that by working on one particular type of neuron, the stop uh, stomatogastric neuron in the lobster or crayfish. And then he made very valiant efforts in the, um, in the early 90s to try to come to grips, um, to try to construct a psychology based on neurology. There's a very famous... Uh, unpublished works of his 100 pages called the, or it doesn't have a title in the original, it's German, some notes he wrote to himself when he visited Fleece in, in Berlin, you know, the guy with the nose, uh, these strange beliefs. Uh, when he visited him in, in Berlin on the way back, he composed this. It was really very clever, I mean, he talks about synapses, uh, he used context point, he doesn't use it, the term synapse since that wasn't introduced by Scheich until a few years later. He talks about that the memory probably resides in the changes of those context point, which now today we know to be true. And he also talks about something like the NCC, he talks about the neurons there whose activity gives rise to conscious sensation. But um, he g very quickly gave that up, he never published that because, and you realize why, because at the time the, so little was known about the brain. It was even controversial that vision took place at the back of the head in terms of prime visual cortex. They knew about functional localization about certain things like the motor cortex had been identified and Broca's area had been identified, but it was really very, very primitive. And in his writing at the time they talk about energies, they talk about sort of um, um, energies, um, uh, around in, in, in the brain and, you know, because they didn't really um, realize about, you know, specific nerve conduction along um, highly specific pathways, although some of that was already known from, uh, from conduction in, um, in muscles. Anyway, so uh, he was a very smart guy, but then he went off and uh, started the church and became very uncritical. Um, how many of you know what this is, the enteric nervous system? 
most of you have one of this in your, in your gut. So the enteric nervous system is part of the autonomic nervous system. It's probably on the order of 50 to 100 million neurons that are down here in your gut. For the most part, you're totally oblivious to the workings of the enteric, uh, enteric nervous system. In fact, you don't want to know. Because when you know about the existence of the enteric nervous system, usually it's when you have, you know, um, bad things happening. I mean, nausea or things like that, or, um, of, of that nature. I mean, the enteric nervous system is responsible for digestion. It's responsible for the peristaltic rhythm that, you know, finally allows you to go to the bathroom. Um, all those sorts of things. Uh, there are neurons there. There are neurotransmitters there. Uh, so you can ask the question, why is it true there are 50 million neurons there? Why don't they uh, give rise to conscious? As far as we know, there isn't any conscious down there. As I said, there's even very little. I mean, there's some communication, but it's basically pretty, to first order, highly autonomous system that works without intervention of the, uh, some people call it the second brain, and some people claim, you know, this is where gut feeling comes from, come from, at least some types of, quote, gut feeling. They come actually from the gut, from the enteric nervous system. And there's some minimal communication, but it's really pretty autonomous. So we have to ask, so this is a, a, a case of a nervous system that seems to work pretty well without consciousness, and we have to ask, well, how is that possible? Where's the difference to those types of systems that give rise to consciousness? Reflexes, at the very simplest level, you know, like uh, this reflex here, that, or the Babinski reflex, right, when you, when you tickle sort of a little below your, your toes to see whether you curl, these are all reflexes. Some of them don't involve the brain proper. Some of them don't involve cortex. And most of them, in fact, just involve local loops through the spinal cord. But they're, you know, so they're, they're reasonable um, um, sensory motor reactions, and they work well without consciousness. Uh, we'll now talk about some of these cases, posture judgment, esti esti estimating steepness of hills, reaching and grabbing. In fact, most, over most overtrained abilities of this ilk, most things that we do every single day, like talking, like driving, like climbing, like dancing, like, you know, lots of other things um, um, are, 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 are done unconsciously. Now, of course, you can perfectly well become conscious of, of when you drive, or when you climb, or when you talk, but usually it's after the fact, probably a couple of hundred milliseconds later, and, and um, uh, in fact, you, when you become conscious of many of these things, and when you try to interfere with it, very often, if it's a highly trained ability, it might actually give rise to a, uh, to a, um, to lessen, um, to a decreased performance. That's the function of training. That's why you train and train and train so you don't have to think about it. You can execute the action effortlessly. The dissociation between what you see and what your eyes see, and of course, and there's famous, which I won't talk about, because for one, there isn't all that much evidence for it, although, the basic idea, once again, is plausible that many high-level decisions in your, that you take, like why did I marry a particular person, why did I go to college X rather than to college Y, you know, sort of these important lifestyle, uh, uh, life-changing decisions, probably may be beyond the realm of conscious introspection. And what you're conscious of after the fact, you know, one morning you wake up and you decide, okay, I'm going to do it, and then you try to uh, reconstruct knowing yourself, knowing something about your own history, why, you know, why did I make this decision now? Well, probably because A, B, C, and D. And those, that might be true, or it might not be true, depending how well you can sort of um, hypnotize, to, to what extent you actually know about thyself, about yourself, and uh, how much are you enthralled um, about various, about the way you would like to be, rather than the way you really are. And of course, this is sort of one of the adages of Western philosophy, know thyself. And so we know it's very, very difficult to know, that, to know yourself because of all these wonderful compensation mechanisms we have in our head that prevent us from trying to understand what we really like and what we really want and what we really, you know, this, the true decisions, um, the, the true reasons for our decisions. So all of that just to say that it's really unclear to what extent we have access to high level, we have conscious access to many of these high level decisions. Now, I'll be following much of the work of two neurology, uh, neuropsychologists, Dan, David Milner at St. Andrews in Scotland and Mel Goodale at the uh, uh, University of Western Ontario in Canada. They've written an entire book on it, which I recommend. I think it's one of the supplemental readings, The Visual Brain in Action. They call all these systems online systems. Online because it's, there's some evidence, and we'll mainly talk about next, uh, this coming Friday, next lecture, that these systems, that these systems don't really have access to uh, memory. They work in the here and now. They don't have access to short-term memory. The idea is that all these systems are there online in order to deal with some, uh, with some contingency, right? I have to reach out and grab this. 
very, it doesn't really happen that I say, okay, I'm going to grab this, but I'm going to wait three seconds, and then I'm going to reach out. The claim is, if I do that, then I evoke a, con for that, I need a conscious system. Just reaching out and grabbing, just reaching out and scratching, just talking, just driving, all those things I do online, in real time, there's no need for memory. And that, that might, in fact, be one way, one operational way I can distinguish the online system from the conscious systems. Now, Francis Crick and I call these zombie systems. Why? Well, it's just a cute name. <laughs> Remember that movie? <laughs> Night of the Living Dead? So we call these zombie systems, um, the, many, the idea is that there are many zombie systems in your head. Each one is sort of dedicated, or zombie agents, each one is dedicated to subserve one particular function. So one zombie system might have one particular input, like your eyes, or like your... Um, you know, the, uh, the receptors in your ear, in a ear that tells you, you the orientation of your head, or, you know, uh, the, your ears for, for auditory input, or, you, or your olfactory system, the vomo nasal system, and that might have one particular output, like it might control um, um, uh, sexual behavior, or it might control social behavior, or it might control my eyes, or it might control the way I run and the way I climb. So the, so the idea is that you have this multitude of these different systems most of which are, of course, not segregated. They're part, some of them will overlap in the brain. They subserve very specific function. They're trained up. It is quite likely that in order to train them up, you actually needed to be conscious. Um, but that once you train them, you don't need consciousness anymore. Procedural memory that we'll talk about in next week, they, uh, most of these systems involve sort of procedural memories. Now, zombies is also a technical term, believe it or not. Uh, of course, zombies originally come from the, the name comes from um, from uh, from voodoo from the voodoo culture out of um, uh, West Africa and Haiti, and of course it denotates somebody who's you know zombie who sort of who's um, there's this process of zombification that people talk about is somebody who where the the sorcerer what's they call the sock sorcerer I think the sorcerer soko or something uh, has put a special pal a spell on this person and this person is now undead. Um, there's actually some interesting um, research done on that topic. It turns out that one of these potions that these sorcerer administers to these to the unsuspecting victims of zombification actually contains a very effective uh, poison called TTX, which is gained from the puffer fish, which is used today in neurobiology, of course, to block sodium channels. It's a very infectant um, um, muscle paralyzer. And um, the claim is that this is one of the active uh, ingredients in this um, potion that these people drink or become ad administered unsuspectingly. What? Don't touch. Okay. Um, now, in, in philosophy, zombies mean something related to that. It means a person who is exactly like me, who, I mean, not like me, Christoph, but just like another person, um, who is... Um, who behaves exactly like a normal person would, who claims that they're conscious, but there's no light inside them. It doesn't feel like anything to be this person. So this, the zombie would sort of, uh, you know, procreate and have children and live a normal, you know, normal, I wouldn't say happy life because there is no feeling to him or her. But the idea is that, that this person behaves exactly like a normal person would, and you can't tell them apart, with the only difference that inside there's no light. It doesn't feel like anything to be the zombie. And this is sort of a Gedanken experiment that's used um, uh, by, by, by philosophers to argue for and against the notion that uh, consciousness uh, is necessary or is not necessary. Is, is, uh, philosophers are concerned about the question, to what extent does consciousness follow from the natural properties of the world? To what extent is it supervenient uh, from, those in, from the natural laws in the universe? Or to what extent does it transcend them? To what extent do you need to add something special? And for example, most famously, uh, David Chalmers has argued in his PhD thesis, where he's popularized the term "the hard problem," that you can that everything we know today, at least, about the laws of physics and chemistry and biology, they are they are they, well, sorry, put differently, that consciousness does not arise out of any of these laws right now. There's no there's no right now lawful explanation for 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 why a zombie should not exist. In other words, he says it's perfectly compatible with everything we know about science today that everybody in the universe, including myself, is, is a zombie, that conscience doesn't exist. Yet, he takes as a starting point the obvious fact that he, David Chalmers at least, is conscious and has sensation of pain and pleasure and beauty and all of that, and so do you, most of you, at least I assume most of you. Um, and so there's this discrepancy. So therefore, he says this is known as the hard problem. 
the heart problem, when philosophers refer to the heart problem, it's a heart epistemological problem. As compared to the easy epistemological problem. Easy, that's what we do. That's what, that's what scientists do. Now, of course, they realize it's not easy in the, in the practical sense, but it's easy in the sense that for every function that you can imagine that consciousness has, let's say if consciousness, the function is planning or memory access or all of those things, you can imagine some sort of mechanism that does that. Although in practice, it's going to be very difficult to figure that out. But in, conceptually, epistemologically, it's not difficult to imagine how, how, such mechanisms, just like for artificial intelligence. The hard problem is that it's, it's, it's hard right now. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no idea why, how consciousness should, f uh, from what property of, of the world does consciousness follow. And so all of that is based on, on this idea of zombies, that there's no law in the universe that prevents all of us from being zombies. Okay, so zombies in that, in, that, in that sense do not exist. It's a very important point. There's no evidence that you can have these complex properties that we associate with consciousness, such as uh, you know, short-term memory and planning and all this, without having consciousness. In fact, when a patient has lost uh, conscious access to for color or for object or for smell or for whatever, then there are always losses. There are always behaviors that the patient cannot do. There's no case known, and, and I claim there will never be a case, where a patient can have, um, you know, let's say a patient has lost conscious access to parts of whatever it is, vision or, or olfaction or self consciousness without also having a concomitant loss in some function. But yet there are these mini-zombie systems. Okay. Oops, sorry, it should be in yellow. So, a classical, a simple case, this was done in, a number of years ago already by above mentioned Mel Goodale. So, this relates, on, this relates to saccadic suppression. Remember, saccadic suppression is the fact that when you move your eyes, due to mechanisms that are, that are, being, that are still ill understood, you don't really see, your vision is partly shut down when you move your eyes, right? I don't know whether you ever tried this, what I, what I said you should, looking in the bathroom mirror and sort of trying to see, trying to catch your own eyes in, in movement, you can't do it. Partly that's because of, 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 um, of uh, the fact that when you move your eyes, your vision is, is severely reduced. Okay, so now you're sitting in the dark and there's a target. Let's say you're sitting in the dark and there's a little LED. And the LED goes off and the LED over here goes on. Okay, so the target jumps from here, as it were, to some other location. And then the subject sits there and just does this quick saccade. So this is the velocity of, of, uh, of her eyes. So she makes a very quick saccade here, gets in the neighborhood of that point. This saccade is made, it's a ballistic saccade. The idea is it's open loop. You know, the brain sort of computes, okay, I'm here, I need to go over there, so let me quickly make a jump in that direction. And usually it undershoots, and then she makes a second uh, so-called corrected saccade. And she, uh, after, you know, what's the time? Okay, the time doesn't, it's like, like after 150 or 200 milliseconds, the uh, target lands right on, the, uh, the eye lands right on target. Same thing with the hand. So you do the same thing with the hand. The, you're, you're pointing at the target. The target goes off, the target goes on over here. You make a shift with your hand. It takes a little bit longer, partly because, of course, the hand is substantially more, you know, it's heavier. Uh, it's sort of more, more uh, you know, more inertia rather than the, the eyeball. Okay, uh, now here what the experimentalists did, um, sometimes where, while the subject moves her eyes, you cheat and you move the target a little bit more, you move it a little bit outward. Okay, just a little bit. Let's say, you know, it's five degrees and you move it by another half degree. And then you ask the subject to, uh, to uh, well, and you don't tell anything that, uh, to the subject. Just like before, okay, so, and, and you do this, the important point is you, do, you move this target while, uh, while she actually makes her saccade. Okay, that's important because otherwise you could see it. So as I said here, when, 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 the, when the woman moves her eyes, vision is a little bit shut down, so you don't, you don't really see this. Uh, yet after what, yet the, the subject still, just like here, she makes a corrective saccade and at the end she lands right on target. Now with the eye, uh, 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 same thing with the hand. The hand is slower and makes a single smooth movement. The remarkable thing is the subject doesn't know this. The subject cannot tell this case from this case. To the subject, in both cases, what happened, the target went off, the target over here went on, she made an eye movement to it. She, had, she cannot distinguish this from this. So you could do that, you could ask her to distinguish it, or you can do, for example, half the time you move the target outward, half the, target, half the time you move the target inward. 
right? So half the time she has to do this this corrective saccade, or half the time she does this corrective saccade. And you ask her, you know, would tell me which was it the inward or the outward, and she doesn't know. So um, here you have a nice case uh, when you have a dissociation between what your visual system knows and what you see, what you know. In this case, the visual system knows that, that the target moves and makes a, uh, um, and corrects for that. Yet you, the conscious you, you you don't see that. Now you can see it if, if, like I said, if you move the target during the period here or here when the eye is stationary, or if you make a big step. You know, if you move it by another five degrees or something, then you will become conscious of it. But for for small uh, for small shift, the the subject doesn't have access to this information. Functionally, you can make a nice story. Why would you, right? You, as we, as I emphasized several times, you move your eyes roughly 100,000 times a day. If every time you moved your eyes, you would have to be conscious of it, given the limited conscious, you know, access that you have. You know, it'll clutter up. I mean, you know, your entire life will be nothing but eye movements. I mean, you wouldn't be conscious of anything but eye movements. So, the idea is the eye movement is a perfect example of a highly stereotypical system. Okay, you have the eyes, the eyes are constant load, the load doesn't change, the size, you know, very different than this, this for instance, is always a constant load. You have six eye muscles that you move. It's highly, highly trained, you do this very early on in life, and so there's really no reason to involve consciousness. That's not to say that, that, you, cannot not be, that you cannot become conscious of your eye movements, but that's probably a different mechanism and, and for sure it takes much longer time. Same thing with pain, for instance, it's, it's, it's uh, very interesting. Most people assume that you put your finger on a hot on a hot plate of a let's say your stove and you move your finger away because of pain. That's probably not the case. In fact, I would really be surprised if that's the case. Uh, I think first what you have you have a very fast resp uh, reaction and the pain the aff the affect I'm pretty sure will only follow later. In other words, you're probably not withdrawing your hand in response to the painful aspect of that. I mean, clearly you can right if you leave your f a hand on it for many seconds till you actually feel the pain and then you move it away. But you know, um, certainly if you're at, at our stage, in other words, if you're an adult, you've already experienced what it is to put your hand on a hot uh, pl uh, plate, and you know it can be very long, you know, there can be a very bad thing happening to you, um, you, you remove it very, very quickly, and that's probably done before you actually perceive the pain. I, I, I mean, I haven't really seen anybody who tests that, but... Uh, so some nice experiments here by somebody called Lee, there's a whole... Uh, where. Um, the claim is here is that you, this zombie system not only operates for your eye movements, and the different types of eye movements, we've only talked about saccadic, these fast eye movements, but also for all sorts of uh, body adjustment. As I walk around, well here I don't really have to adjust myself, but if, you know, if I walk in the hills, you know, I constantly have to adjust myself depending on the load I carry, depending on the steepness of the hills, right? When you go, you know, when you go out in, let's say, downtown Pasadena on Sunday, uh, you know, on Saturday evening at 9 o'clock, you cross the street, it's incredible complex what you have to do, right? There's all this traffic, foot traffic, road traffic. You have to move your body, particularly if you run, you have to really move very, very quickly as a function of the incoming visual information. The claim is that all of that happens so fast and so effortlessly that it doesn't involve conscience. You do it unconscious. So here they tested this, for example, they put people in this room, when you have a second a sort of suspended seal, you know, you have the suspended room here inside uh, the, the real room. And uh, the floor is fixed. And now you gently move the, you gently move the, the floor back, and f uh, the, this sort of ceiling back and forth. So you don't move the floor, you move the ceiling back and forth. And again, if you do it over, over, over um, a short time, um, so here, the, here you, you, you give the room sort of the sign of the little, you gently sway the room back and forth. If you do over small distances, the person will sort of compensate for that automatically. Uh, you know, the person will sway. And again, you know, I'm sure if you do it over this, you know, over this distance, you'll notice. But if you do it over a very small distance, the claim is the person doesn't notice. Again, you know, it's something you do all the time effortlessly. It's a very specialized system. Why clog up uh, your limited bandwidth that you have for, for, for conscious perception? Let me see. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. So we'll talk on Friday, we'll talk mainly about patients. We'll talk about various evidence from patients, from particular patients with specific lesions, from patients with what's called blind side, from patients who have uh, specific at ataxies. And so there you'll see there's some nice evidence for reaching and grabbing. It's another one of these uh, systems that works very sophisticated when you reach out and grab something. You immediately make, make a judgment as to how big it is, how heavy it is, 
or that you make implicitly and, un and unconsciously you do it every time. Every time you reach out and grab something, you, 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 you make these unconscious, very complicated processing. Um, let me show you, yeah, estimating steepness of hills. Trust the scientist to study this. So, uh, there's this, um, yeah, prophet in, I think, University of Pennsylvania studied this. So he studied how do, how do people perceive steepness? Now, I don't know about you, but I have always had this, and I only realized it once I read his papers, I've always had this disconnect when, when you know, I mean, let's say you're driving in the California Sierras, and you drive somewhere, you know, up at um, Mineral King, for example, somewhere in this uh, um, uh, Sierra National Park, and there's a road and it says, you know, 5% um, inclination. And you think, no way, this is not 5%, this is 20%, right? When, you know, when, when by your judgment, you think it's really very, very steep. And you could, I mean, I always had the surprise that I had difficulty believing that those signs were correct, because I always found that they vastly underestimated the, the steepness. So that's essentially, it turns out that's true. There, there is a dissociation. I mean, the, 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 the road bill has got the angle right, but there's this dissociation between the way you perceive the steepness and, and the actual steepness, and it's rather interesting. So these people, Prophet et al, studied, studied this question. So in university, they went to some, uh, one campus, University of Pennsylvania, where you have lots of different hills. And they essentially asked people, uh, undergraduate, they sort of randomly waited for people to come by and asked them to judge the steepness of, of one particular hill using three different criteria. One was just to say it in, um, you know, to estimate it in angles. The other one was to do it visually using a protractor, where essentially they had to adjust this disk uh, sort of, you know, they, they, they could look at the hill and they were asked to adjust the disk in, um, in relation to what they felt was the steepness. Now, they don't describe exactly, and I haven't seen the video of the hill, but the idea was what I get from the experiment that, you know, they were standing in front of the hill, and so it wasn't that there was a, you know, silhouette they can judge, but they're essentially standing in front of the hill and they were told to adjust the, uh, the protractor to, 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 the, to the angle of the hill. And then laughing, they had to do this, but they had to do this t t tactile, uh, out of sight of the hand, so they were sort of asked blindly to adjust the, uh, the, the, uh, the slope of this protractor to what they felt was a perceived, was, was a, was a perceived um, uh, angle of the hill without looking at it. So verbally, visually, and then just tactile. Okay, this is the real angle of the hill. Of the, of, the, of the different hills, varying between 0 and 40 degrees. This is the, judge, the perceived angle. Now, if people were perfect, this is what they should say, right? If they could physically, if they had access to the true angle, they should be on here. Now, if you look at the haptic measurement, it's actually pretty good. So for, for small angle, it's overestimated, but then, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not bad. Now, both visually and verbally, what they estimated was actually relatively the same. It's a high degree of concordance. So this really, sh what, well, what implication, the implication is that really here you're making use of the same sort of information, probably visual information, and here you just express it one way and you express it, I mean, here you express it, you know, using Broca's area, but that's probably exactly the same sort of information, but it's very different than here. And what you do, you consistently overestimate by a big, big amount, you overestimate the steepness of the hill. You consistently overestimate. So for example, when it's 10 degrees, on average, you say it's actually tw between 25 and 30 degrees. And this is exactly what I, that's always been my experience, that when I was on a 10 degrees road, I always felt it was much, much higher. Um, you know, when you're on a 20 degrees, it's actually, you know, closer to 35 or 40 degrees. So there's a persistent overestimate of the visual, um, uh, the, the um, estimate of the slope based on visual cues, but not if you do it uh, using a different system. So the claim is that this is a dissociation between, vision, between two different aspects of vision, between vision for action and vision for perception. And just keep that in mind because we'll return to it. That if you do that, that one, part of the, one part of your brain, namely the one that gives rise to visual perception, or language in this case seems to be the same, they vastly overestimate the, the angle, while the other system that sort of might be closer to the vision for action system, where you cle it clearly requires visual input, since you have to look at the hills, you don't get to touch them or walk on them first, you, you have to judge them visually, but then you're sort of, you're supposed to adjust this with your hand. This other system seems to have more veridical information, veridical in the sense it seems to be closer to the true state of the world. 
Now this interesting got worse. They also did this in a separate study. They looked at it. How how does this mismatch between reality and per percept? How does it change when you're old, when you're tired? Um, they did something else. At the beginning of a climb and at the end of a climb. Okay, that, that was the same. Oh yeah, when you have a he heavy load and when you have a light load. And what they found is very striking effects that when you when you asked to carry a, a very heavy backpack with lots of you know stones in, in this case, or when you were tired at the end of a day versus at the beginning of the day, you would make a bigger um, uh, you would uh, you would judge this even larger than before. So if you are young and fit and didn't have the law to carry, your estimate was closer to the veridical to the actual truth than when you were uh, frail or when you were you know, tired or when you were very um, when you had to carry a big load. No. Could be LO. Is, is there an fMRI study to, to say, a functional imaging study to show which part of the brain is involved in doing these shape estimates? No. I mean, the estimate, the, uh, people have studied like areas like LO for shape estimation, but, I, you know, but that's shape estimation of objects that are, you know, two images, two dimensional images of objects. Here, they, uh, in, in part of this paper with Prophet, it's a very nice paper, this psychologist who studied this. They, 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 at, the la, at the last uh, picture, they show this. This is a dis, this, uh, depiction of a race, a 10-mile race called the Charlotte Char 10-mile race. And they give you, uh, so in this, in this little description of this, of the, the, the little topo associated with this foot race, they give you the individual miles. And this is the elevation. And uh, this is the last sentence they have. The last mile of the course, this is a sentence in the brochure for the, for the runners. The last mile of the course retraces the rolling first mile. But now the downhills are more painful for some runners than the uphills. So this turns out to be identical to this physically. It's the same mile. Yet here, the, the, uh, for whatever reason, the artist who drew this, this perspective sort of you know, vastly, you know, hugely em um, um, emphasized the changes in elevation compared to this. And the claim of profit is that's exactly what uh, runners experience. Because here, you're much more tired. And then you experience the, the hills as steeper than uh, you did at the beginning of the day when you were when you were about to run the race. So the claim is the explanation is it's one of these you know evolutionary but well I'm not sure even evolutionary it's one the explanation they say well it's obviously much more much much less expensive for the organism to overestimate the steepness and the un, to underestimate it. Right? To underestimate steepness could really be bad that you you, you know that you that you you're willing to run up this hill although it's sort of it, it it's going to overtax you and you'll you'll be more likely to be eaten than if you if you're a little bit more cautious. That's sort of the high-level explanation of the psychologist. But it is a, it's a very striking dissociation. On the other hand, there's another case when I looked at, at when I was reviewing this a year ago for my book, where you do not find a dissociation. And it's a little bit surprising, and I don't know why you find in one case this dissociation between the perceived, uh, between, in this case, one variable, uh, between the, the uh, a dissociation between what your, let's see, your haptic systems uh, uh, perceive and what your visual system uh, perceives in one case, but not in the other. This is a study by Jack Loomis. Jack Loomis is a psychologist at Santa Barbara. You see um, Santa Barbara, and he's sort of one of the world's experts on navigation, navigation that people use to navigate around 2D space or 3D space like pilots. Also, he works with blind people and, you know, put, put G, uh, you know making use of GPS, etc. So here he studied uh, distance estimate. So you know, essentially ask you how far you know am I to that uh, whiteboard? Let's say to the first edge of that whiteboard there. Okay, so that's one way estimate. And so people estimate this visually. You know, after a while you you know I would probably say it's like five meters. And then they then he said, okay, now close your eyes and walk um, till you till. Okay, I cheated. <laughs> walk to there till you think you've come at that at that point. He did it without there being anything uh, physically. No, no, there was a light pole present or something like that. You couldn't really hurt yourself running into things. Um, and then he did different cues. He did it in the light. He did it in the dark. He did it when there was an isolated cue on the ground. He did it when there was a cue up at, at my eye height, because, of course, you get different estimates. Um, so here, what he sees, this is a physical distance. This is for short distances, up to, you know, up to 6 meters, up to 20 feet. And here's the indicated distance, either... Um, either visually or verb so, so, so either verbally when I say okay I think this is like four meters or walk when people close their eyes and walk till they think they've reached that point. 
Okay, so they close their eyes and they walk till they think they're actually at that point. And what you can see, just if you look at them, A, two patterns. A, B, A, this is real distance, this line here. Well, this is if people would, be, would have accurate access to the true distance, then they should be on the line. And, for example, here, uh, uh, when you have the Q at eye level, so in other words, if he puts a little light at, at the height of at, at my eye level height, then I'm really very good at estimating that for short distances. Uh, here he puts the Q down on the floor, doesn't really make much difference. Um, this was dark. This was only when I think there was a single light present. So this is with, with I mean, in natural conditions like this, when I have access to lots of information, this I think you only had a single light here or a single light down on the floor. And obviously you're much worse at, at, in, in that case. But the other, so A, in general, you're doing pretty uh, good. The other thing to notice, which is very different from before, is there's always this high degree of concordance between the verbally or visually estimated distance and the actual walk distance. So he shows that in a second plot. So he plots the, 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 the visual estimate of the distance as expressed to the by the subject in words, I'm four meters away, to the distance expressed by the by their by their you know, uh, walking system, you can see it's a, it's a very high correlation. So here you don't have a disconnect. Right, so here, you, A, you're doing pretty well in terms of having access to the true distance, and B, those two different sources of information give rise to the same, uh, same uh, output, while uh, here you have, uh, you have this haptic system gives rise to much better uh, information than, than the visual system. Why? Why is one dissociated and the other one not? Who knows? Uh, yeah, so the claim is that many, if not most, um, overtrained sensory motor activities were used procedural learning, which we'll discuss later, where you, which you have to learn by doing the same procedure over and over again. Like, I mean, particularly for all of us, it's driving, but it's also things like, you know, riding a bike and, and brushing your teeth and um, talking and all these activities that do require um, uh, lots of feedback early on. Uh, I mean, most of this happens in our childhood, but of course driving doesn't, and you know, dancing or you know, other things like rock climbing, any other sophisticated sensory motor activity that you do doesn't happen till you're, uh, till you're older. All, all of that requires several things. It requires constant, constant training. It requires probably, at the time when you're doing it, you have to be highly exquisitely conscious of what you're doing. But once you, what you do, once what you're doing, you're really doing it in a very trained. You're really trained, or you've overtrained, as people say. You can do it uh, effortlessly. In fact, very often, then when you stop to think about it, when you stop the activity and think about it and think what to do next, um, your performance drops. It'll interfere. It'll interfere with the performance, and you have to back up and say, okay, let me just not think about it. Let, let me just do it. It's also very. The other characteristics of these things is of these ability of these um, at, um, uh, skills is that it's exceedingly difficult to explain them to somebody in the abstract. I can perfectly well explain you as I'm doing. I'm demonstrating right now. At least I hope I'm demonstrating. I can talk to you about abstract semantics, things like consciousness and about you know theory of relativity or mathematics. But I cannot really tell you about the, how to drive a car. I mean, I can tell you abstract what the pedals are and you know the relationship, the steering wheel, etc. But the, the only way to really learn is to actually to do it. Of course, trainers call this muscle memory, right? You have to get the muscle memory. It's not only the muscle. Of course, the learning isn't actually in the muscle. It's in the sensory associated uh, basal ganglia and motor cortex. But sort of it, it denotes what I mean by that. I found this wonderful quote. This is a beautiful instance. It's a classic. You should read it. It's a classic of the meditation literature, Zen and the Art of Archery. Subsequently, of course, there have been a few books, uh, particularly Zen and the Art of... Um, the art of tea drinking, and then, of course, then in the art of motorcycle maintenance. They all come from this, uh, the, um, this book here. This um, describes, uh, I think it was a German professor before the war, in fact, he went to, to Japan and learned in the 30s and learned um, to, show, to shoot um, these huge bows, you know, these bows that are, that are bone arrow that are almost as big as a man. And they take, incredible, uh, they take many years of training. A, they are just physically incredible demanding. And... Um, it's a very zen-like thing. I mean, this is where you train the first six months. You just look at the bow and you walk around and something. You never touch the bow. This is the, f the first training that you do. It's not something that we here in California, I think, would take, take on with vengeance. Anyhow, the, at the end of the book, he has this little um, description where he talks about other, um, other um, similar um, 
uh, skills, like in this case, uh, the skill of, um, of uh, fighting with a sword. And I mean, I was really just struck by this quote. Because particularly it relates to the t some of the things that we talked about in, in class, undivided attention. The enlightening reaction, which has no further need of conscious observation. In this respect, at least, the pupil makes himself independent of all conscious purpose, and that is a great gain. So what he stresses in this entire chapter, that once you do it, at effort, you have to do it in order to do it to truly master archery or swordsmanship, you have to do it at the level of uh, where you do it so effortlessly that you don't think about it. And if you think about it, it interferes. That's exactly what, what he says here. It's really very nice. Now, these things have not been studied a lot uh, scientifically, obviously, for, 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 well, for a number of reasons. Um, it's, you know, in humans, of course, it's much more difficult to do it. And, you know, doing the, over these time scales really does not lend itself very well to sort of to, to laboratory research. But, of course, any training book that you read uh, training in you know any any particular activity, including even golf, uh, they emphasize that uh, they emphasize this nature of the of the true mastery of a sport. Sort of requires you to do this this training and to requires you to let go and not think about things. Um, so there's this Milne and Goodale, and they uh, published this book called The Visual System in Action where they really argue, based on a lot of a hundred years of prior research in neurology and in neurophysiology, uh, about the ventral and dorsal system. So they talk specifically about vision. Um, remember, okay, let me just move forward here. Remember this. This is a monkey brain, but similar in the human brain. And we know from lots of clinical literature in, the, in humans, and we know from lesional uh, studies in monkeys and from electrophysiological uh, uh, recordings in the monkey, that there are two broad, two broad uh, pathways, two broad streams of uh, information in the visual system. They both originate in primary visual cortex. One moves then down here to the, um, to the infratemporal cortex, the posterior, uh, central, and uh, anterior infratemporal cortex. This is the ventral stream, okay, and this is the dorsal stream that moves to interpietal sulcus and then on to prefrontal cortex, and from here it also moves to prefrontal cortex. So those two streams, if you want, they sort of reconverge in the frontal part of the brain. That these are all the neurons uh, that are involved in very specific um, um, uh, object identity. So here, for example, you have neurons that respond to specific colors or that respond to specific faces or to other things. Well, here you have neurons that seem to encode more, that seem to encode things like reaching or moving your eyes. Um, this is where, for example, Richard Anderson does his research in the parietal reach area where they want to implant the electrode for, for neuroprosthetic uh, purposes in patients. We also know about patients that if you have a lesion here in this, this part of the brain around the intraparietal sulcus, you'll have difficulty with, with reach movement, for example, or you get um, things like neglect. Well, here, if you have a lesion here, you don't have any difficult with sensory motor. You have specifically difficult in perception. You'll get things like um, optic agnosia, uh, like uh, prosopagnosia in case of faces, that you're unable to recognize the face. You can see the individual things, but you're unable to put it together in a, um, as, a, as, a, as a face or similar visual deficiencies. So this is why uh, people also call this the vision for perception pathway, and this is the vision for action pathway. The idea is that the vision for perception pathway, those are the neurons that underlie uh, visual perception, when I look at something and I see it consciously. Well, these are the neurons that also take visual input, but they're responsible for guiding me. If I want to walk from here to there, if I want to reach out something under visual guidance, that's what this part of the brain does. So Milner and Goodale um, spun the story that, uh, based on a patient, a uh, very striking patient we'll talk about on Friday, uh, but also from some of the evidence I just reviewed and some more that, that's going to come right now, that, uh, that these two systems really map onto the online unconscious system versus the conscious system. That the ventral pathway is really responsible for conscious vision for, for perception, and the dorsal pathway is really responsible for all these online systems. Online is essentially, as I mentioned before, based on one patient, you can show that, that if the patient can do certain things automatically, although she claims she can't see, she can still execute visual motor behavior. But if you ask her to delay, if you ask her, okay, wait for three seconds, then she's unable to do that. And it fits nice in, nicely in with the idea that these systems are online, they work in the here and now, they don't require memory because they're made for reaching, for grabbing, for, for, for doing things immediately in the world. And they, they, they're not made for, for sort of storing things for three seconds and then doing them. 
For that, you would have to activate the, 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 uh, the other system. So um, to review this, so these things, the idea, the online system are relatively simple and stereotyped, like moving your eyes, like, like I mean, simple is a, maybe the wrong word to use here, but I guess stereotype, stereotype that's important thing, like driving. I mean, driving is far from simple, but after a while we do it, we have a feeling at least that we can do it fairly, you know, we can do all sorts of other things while we drive. It's stereotypical. You, you always execute sort of the same um, motor behavior in response to some certain sensory input or sequences of, of motor behavior in response to sequences of, of sensory input over time again and again and again. That's the characteristics. Short response time, they re really re react very fast. That's the entire point of training. That's why people in the army and the police everywhere train and train and train to make this as short as possible. You don't have access to short-term memory, these systems. We use egocentric coordinate system. What I mean by that is that this visual system is made to actuate. That this visual system is made to move my hand or to move my eyes or to move my limb. Therefore, I want the system has to be in coordinates of the relevant output effect. It has to be in the coordinate that's useful for the hand or it has to be in the coordinate useful for the eye or it has to be in the coordinate useful to my limb. And it needs to have access to the veridical properties of objects. In other words, it really needs to know how far is that object away. How big is that object? How heavy is that object? Because all those things matter, right? If I pick something up, you all must have had this case when you pick something up and it's much heavier than, 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 than we expect, or when it's much lighter and then sort of, you know, you do like this. Or when you go down the stairs and for some reason, you know, it happens rarely, fortunately, we're very good at this, you miscount the number, you know, you bound, you know, you run, you run upstairs, which you would do every day to get to your, let's say, to your house, to your condo, and then for some reason you miscount or somebody played a trick on you and removed the stairs or, or whatever. I mean, that hasn't happened to me, but it has happened to me occasionally for some reason I miscount, and you know you can sort of barely fall short, right? Uh, so, you really, so this system needs to know the true properties as, as best as the brain can of the world. This system can be quite different. A, the, here the claim is it can be arbitrary complex. I can do amazingly complicated things, you know, you know, I can make a movie, I can do anything that humans can do, but using this seeing conscious system. It has any possible number of inputs and any possible number of outputs. It has access to shorter memory. I can perfectly well, you know, I can, you know, remove this slide. You can remember this slide perfectly well for many seconds. Most importantly, it, it, it ha this system has a very different function computationally. This, the, one of the functions of this system, for example, is to recognize a bottle of water, no matter where you see it, no matter whether it's close up or far away, no matter whether it's like this or like this, no matter whether it's half occluded, okay? or when, when it's very, very far away, it only makes up a very small part of your visual space. Why? Because, you know, I, I want to recognize objects like bottles of water or like lines in the world, or like a banana, and I want to recognize them in it because the, there's so many different contexts, there's so many different backgrounds, there's so many different ways the banana can sort of show itself in the real world, depending on where the sun is and where the foliage is, etc. I cannot uh, depend on the vagarities of, 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 of the universe that I can only, you know, that I have a system that sort of just only recognize a banana if it's exactly, you know, this size and this particular orientation. Clearly, that wouldn't work very well. So this system needs to have objects constancy, for example. It needs to recognize things independent of their distance, independent of their shape, independent of their location, which is very different from this system. Now, now this, I mean, to you, all of this might seem fairly obvious, but it's, 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 it's far from it, particularly early on, because early on the idea was, let's say in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, partly motivated by machine vision, that the way for them to build a visual system is you have sensors, cameras, or other sensors. They all feed together into one central representation of the world. So you have a central map of the world where, let's say, all the visual information is reconstructed as best as the robot or the, or, or the animal can. Okay, it's all said, you know, you take the two eyes and you get stereo and you take motion and you, you feed all that information into one map, the internal representation of the world, that you make it ac as accurate as you can. And then you use that information then to plan or to move your actuators or whatever. But here, what's happening now and what we know from, from biology, it seems to be very different that there's this multitude of different systems they are own specialized, there are a whole bunch of specialists, those are the zombie system, and then you, you might have one more general purpose module, but that general purpose module is slower, and, and, uh, main, uh, and yes, it can control all the other modalities, but uh, the main drawback is that it's, that it's slower. So very often in life, you want to use the specialist system. And the specialist system have access to their own special information, but they may not have access to the general purpose information, because that might just not be fast enough. 
And so that's why, uh, I mean, couldn't you say, well, the system has access to this information, but it turns out that, for example, this system uses different information than this system, and it has to, because computationally, the function of the system is different. So Mill and Goethe made some specific, uh, rather ingenious predictions, particularly about object constancy. Um, now, you might all know this illusion. Now, perceptually, I mean, you know in the context in which I'm asking this, so you, you can imagine what the answer is. But just if you look at it, doesn't this monster look much bigger than this one? Right? Clearly does. Substantially bigger. Now, um, I guess what I should do next time, actually cut it out and move it over here, because they're exactly the same. Um, Uh, well, <laughs> trust me, I'm a scientist. <laughs> They're exactly the same. Um, what goes on here, due to the perspective geometry, the fact that it's placed high and it's placed more distant in this tunnel, um, um, we, 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 um, and we suffer from this illusion that, um, that this one has to be much bigger than this one, when, when in fact they're exactly the same. So in general, we have this remarkable thing called object constancy. When, when we look at things, let's see, if I move this twice as far away, the angle it substands is going to be, you know, um, um, half the size. The area is going to be a quarter of the size. Yet, yet things don't look that way. I mean, they, they, they for sure look smaller. Right? Clearly, I can see this is smaller than when it's far away. But they don't look nearly as, as small as they should, just based on, on, on geometry. If you look at a, your friend and you ask your friend to walk twice the distance, she's not going to look twice. She's not going to look half the size. As she should be, just based on simple geometry. What goes on here? Well, we have this mechanism, or a whole set of mechanisms, probably called object constancy, that enable us that we know, of course, something about dimension of people, and we and we know something about geometry, etc. And um, but, but so we so things that are farther away don't look as small as they should. It's a special mechanism called object constancy. Now, what Mill and Goodell claim that those should not exist, or those object constant illusion should be much weaker for the vision for action system. Why? Well, if I have to look at and identify that bottle of, uh, that bottle of water here, then yes, it, as I said, it's great that I can do it independently of where it sits or independently whether it's big or small or upside down. However, when I'm supposed to reach out and grab it, I better know its exact distance because when it's here or when it's here, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be able to directly grab it here or here. Correct, I mean, I want to know the correct distance. Also, I'd like to know, you know, same applies for weights, etc. I wa really want to know the exact geometry. And so, therefore, when I'm, uh, when I'm reaching out for things to pick them up, I should not suffer from this illusion compared when I'm just looking at this. So, he made use of this illusion called, uh, named after the German psychologist Titchener. So, let's see. Um, See which one is which one? I have to look at it again. So just judge this disk with respect to this, and this with respect to this. So which one is large? Which one are the same? One of them is the same. One of them is smaller. So I'm just asking you to judge the size of this disk compared to that one, or the size of this disk compared to that one. Okay. Good. Okay, good. Good. Excellent. Okay, so you all suffer from this illusion. This is the real, that's why I put it next to This is the real, uh, this is the original thing. So here they're actually the same size, exactly the same size. But here what happens, you do, um, your visual system does a normalization. So here it says, well, because it's surrounded by these little disks, and here it's surrounded by these disks, uh, big disks, so this disk appears uh, smaller compared to that, and this one appears bigger. Well, here actually, this disk has been adjust, uh, adjusted. It's like 10% larger than this one. So that he, physically, this one is larger than this. Yet perceptually, they appear to be the same size. Now let's see. I try to do this. Uh, right, so you can try to move it there. So that's so you can see it, it doesn't quite fit inside, right? And. I should have made a JavaScript, but you know, I was, had to give a big talk yesterday evening. And there you see, oops, um, okay, no, that doesn't work. 
No, I don't know. Anyhow, this is a, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, sorry. Oops. Anyway, so the, I mean, this is, it's a small effect. Here, it's, it's roughly the size is like 10% of the illusion. So if I make this 10% larger than this one, then they'll look the same. Here, they're physically exactly the same, but perceptually dissimilar. So now what, what um, uh, Mel Goodale did, he asked people to judge this psychophysically, just uh, like I'm asking you, which one is larger. And then also he made discs, sort of, uh, what he had, these are a little elevated, this and this are little elevated wooden blocks. And he asked them, he asked people to pick them up. And then he puts these LEDs on their, on their, thing, on their, on their thumb and their, the, uh, what's his full finger? Index finger. And what you do, what we all do, if I, for example, give this to you and you reach it out, thank you, I'm going to take it from you again. <laughs> what you'll do as you reach out, you automatically scale your grip proportional to what I give you. We, we all do that effortlessly. It's one of these unconscious things we do all the time. So if I give you something big, you might really go reach, you know, if I give you my, my laptop, I'm not going to give you my Macintosh, but if I would, then you would immediately have two hands. Or if I give you, you know, a pencil versus that ball of water, you would do this or you would do this. And so you, and it has a, it has a time dependent trajectory. So first you reach, first you overextend and then you, you then you, um, as you get closer to the, um, to the object you're grasping, your, your, your grasp also becomes smaller. And this, by the way, doesn't, you can do this without visual feedback. So I can just show you something, a turn of the light and you reach out to grab and you do the same uh, constant trajectory. And, oh yeah, here it's plotted. So here they did this, um, they asked people to do this, to pick up both here the disk and here the disk, right? So they, I, so they wanted to know, so here perceptually to me they look the same, to you and also to you, they look the same, although this one is physically different. And so the question is, while these ones um, um, physically are the same, yet perceptually this one looks smaller, so the question is, what about my, my, in my, in my scaling, my, my grasp? Here the claim is that because these are, this one is actually physically larger, that my graph should also be physically larger. Although perceptually they look the same. But the claim is, if, if Milner uh, and Goodell's story is true, that the, 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 the vision for action system has access to the true information. And so therefore here it should, the hand should be larger compared to here. And that's what they found. So, um, the, this is the actual, uh, the maximum gr uh, grip aperture here. So as you say, this is the trajectory, right? First you become larger and then sort of you, uh, you become smaller as you, become, as you move closer to the target. And that here the, um, so the, these are perceptually different tiles and these are, uh, sorry, these are perceptually the di different tiles. Here the, the things look exactly the same. So this corresponds to the, uh, this corresponds to the lower case and this corresponds to the upper case. But the, the aperture is not fooled by that. The aperture, if it's a small, if it's physically the small disk, the aperture, the reach, the maximum aperture is smaller than if it's, um, uh, in both cases, it's the same size. Although here, perceptually, here they look the same and here they look different. So that's rather very cute. That's rather nice experiment. I mean, it's a non-trivial prediction. Unfortunately, unfortunately, like often in science, some other people have now replicated it using a bit more complicated situation, using two comparison disks, and they can't find the same result. So now it's up in the air. This came out a year ago, which is really too bad because it, it, it sounds such a nice story, but it's, um, right now it's unclear whether, whether this actually carries through, this, uh, this, the, these particular experiments. So the, the people have tried to make other experiments. There's a whole bunch of illusion. People study this a lot around the turn of the century, the 19th century, where you have all sorts of miller lie illusion, all sorts of other illusions where things appear smaller or larger depending on things in their environment. And illusion books, if you buy illusion books, they're filled with these. And so people are trying to do many of these experiments, and some of the experiments find similar things, other find no effect. I, I, other experiments find no effect in the sense that perception and vision for uh, action have the same, um, have access, to, make use of the same information. So it's, it's up in the air right now. Well, it's up in the air, okay, it's two things up in the air. A, the fact that these, uh, the, the specific prediction that the vision for action system doesn't suffer from the same uh, constancy or suffer, doesn't obey the same co uh, constancy laws that vision for perception does. And B, a claim that I always found very unlikely that this conscious-unconscious distinction maps totally onto the ventral dorsal. 
If you look at the anatomy, these are highly interconnected area. If you remember the processing hierarchy from S and the, all these areas are heavily interconnected. It really would su surprise me if it's something as simple as all those neurons are involved in unconscious and all those neurons are involved in conscious processing. It's likely to be much more complicated. Now, there are other zombie systems that people have studied, um, three of them. One is night walking. It's another one case where there's a, this is a case where uh, there's a PhD topic here waiting, there's a PhD thesis waiting to happen. So I did this a couple of years ago when Crick and I were staying at the Santa Fe Institute for Pro Complexity Research. And then we met this um, Sandra Blakesley, she writes, she's a science writer for the New York Times, and she knew these sort of new age people who promised, who did this thing called night walking. And they promised they get you in touch with your inner, in your child and, you know, with pyramids and all that sort of baloney. So first I thought, you know, this just sounded pretty wacky to me. But then she told me, and said, no, the people are actually pretty sensible and you should try this. And I did, I went there with my two kids. What is it? Well, so this is in, outside, this is in Santa Fe. This was uh, during a moonless night. So we're walking in these arroyos in New Mexico. So this is not flat, right? This is an old riverbed. It's like here walking, you know, up the arroyo here in, in, um, in St. Gabriel Mountains, right? There's lots of rocks, there's sand, there's a riverbed. You walk around. This is at night. So there was some light from the stars, but there was no moon. And the idea is what they did at first is the following. You put this, um, this is a fluorescent sphere. So you shine a light on it and then sort of it fluoresces for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And then the idea is, it's now old, the idea is that you, look, that you walk around, you keep on fixating this. So after, you just look, you never look down, you only just fixate this. After a while, after like 20 minutes, you don't need this. You can essentially just fixate a distant star on the horizon or planet, there was a planet up. You just fixate that and you walk around like that. Now early on, of course, you're very nervous since this is dark and you're, you know, there are bushes and, you know, holes and whatnot. So, you know, early on, so you don't really trust your feet, you constantly look down. But after a while, sort of you walk at, you know, a decent pace like this, and I'm a pretty, you know, I climb and hike a lot. I, I wouldn't have done this before because I wouldn't have trusted myself. But the remarkable thing is, and this is also true for, for, for my kids, that after a while, after you trusted yourself, you got in touch with your inner child, um, it was actually very remarkable. It was actually remarkable that you could walk around. Um, uh, after a while, you sort of stopped looking, uh, looking, uh, looking down. You could walk around perfectly well in this canyon land. Um, just, okay, so what cues do you use? So first of all, they, they say, you do, uh, and I tried it once, if you take a, a smoke glass and you only use your um, fovea, it, it, it's a catastrophe, you don't get anywhere. So, okay, well the very first time, if you close your eyes, it's not gonna work, okay? Um, although there might be some auditory cues, you know, because if you talk, you know, clearly let's say you're in a cave or you're in front of a wall, uh, you know, let's say in your in a room, and you you know you listen to an echo clearly. You can tell something about how you know how how large that is, but it's really not in this relatively open land. So I don't think there's any auditory cue. I mean, one possible explanation is that essentially you just make use of visual memory. You know, you you I don't look down, but you know, of course I can see let's see 30 feet ahead, so I know what the terrain is there, and then I make use of that. So that's something one one would like to repeat these, or I would like at some point to repeat these experiments sort of in a lab, and you can do them. In principle, but the claim is, I mean, not their claim, they had this, this, this sort of new age explanation for it that, that, that just didn't make any sense at all. I, I think, uh, while I talk about it in class, I think what might be going on is the following. This might be an instance of one of these uh, unconscious zombie systems in the sense that you have visual information down here at the extreme periphery. For example, there's some evidence from monkey that in the superior colliculus, the receptive fields go down all the way to 90 degrees. You know, so not, you know, typically you can see, you know, if I look ahead, I can see sort of, you know, probably till 60 degrees or 70 degrees. Here, I, I, at least I feel I cannot see anything anymore. Now, the question is, is that true? So if you actually do control experiments down here, you know, two alternative force choice, for instance, can you actually see down here? Or we've tried that, doesn't work very well with fingers. But is it possible that you can use that information down here to guide your feet? Because that's all what you need to do, right? You don't need to do anything with your fingers. The important thing is you need that information down here in the lower part of your visual field to guide your feet. The claim is you don't need that information down here to do conscious vision because you don't need to look, you know, see down here. You can always do this, right? You don't do complicated object information processing down here. But that information might be perfectly there, for example, in the colliculus, and it's fed directly to the parts of, the, let's say, the basal ganglia or the motor cortex that control my feet or they, that control how long I live, how high I live, right? Because I have to know, you know, whether I lift my foot like this or like this or like this to step over some obstacle. 
So that's so the question is: Is this a case of an unconscious zombie system where you make use of this visual information that's not consciously accessible in, let's say, infratemporal cortex, but then nonetheless can control your factors? Seems entirely plausible to me. One other, two other cases. Uh, I won't talk about this. I'll talk about next week, so I don't want to. But there's some evidence, quite, I mean, quite strong evidence, that for certain fear-evoking stimuli. Um, uh, you do uh, unconscious processing fairly quickly. And then there's a very nice story, particularly for mice right now, but no, it's unclear for humans. So I don't know how many of you know there are actually two visual, you actually have two olfactory systems in your head. I mean, by two, I don't mean the two nostrils, but I mean, you actually have two systems. Well, okay, I should, I should be a little bit careful. L lots of animals have two systems. Mice has been very well studied. They have two olfactory systems. In human, it's probably it might, the second one might be a vestigial organ. It's called in humans also Jacobson or Jacobson's organ. Uh, this is uh, so we have the, the main system we used to smell. It's our, it's our the main olfactory system. We know quite a bit about it. And then there's a second system that um, um, might be vestigial in us called the vomeronasal system. So it's, it's present at the base of the of the nose. You can see it, and in 30 to 40 percent of human fetal tissue, it is visible. It's not; pre it doesn't seem to be present in all human fetal tissue. It's very difficult to find reliable in adults when you do auto autopsy to find it reliable. Um, so it's unclear. Uh, the propensity is probably there. It's there, I think, in macaque monkeys, but uh, it's unclear whether it has any function in even those individuals in which it's still present. The claim is that for, uh, for, and there's lots of very nice studies on it, uh, we had a whole bunch of speakers talk to us about this, that in, in mice, this vomonasal system is a highly specialized system that exists in many, ma anim not only mammals, many other animals. It, it, mediates, uh, f it, it mediates pheromones, it uses pheromones. It might be a highly sensitive system, it might be as sensitive as single individual molecule, uh, in, in, an individual pheromone. And this system is a very special purpose system. This, the one we use is a general purpose system, just like general purpose vision. We can smell almost any, I mean, not quite, but we can almost smell any possible odor. Um, this one is, a, the idea is of the highly, highly dedicated system. There are these signal molecules that usually conspecific uh, use. So they use it for, you know, for, for sex and gender and, and sort of aggression or so, I mean, all sort of social related uh, signals. And there's some recent very nice stuff done at um, Catherine Dulac at Harvard and um, uh, Marcus Meister and Axel Rich at uh, Columbia and other uh, people where they specifically, we can now specifically inactivate in a mouse, we can specifically inactivate this vomonasal system. And so we can study um, uh, uh, specific sex link, um, sex link behavior in mice that involves this system. Now, there's some claim, there was a bunch of nature papers a couple of years back by Barbara McClintock in Chicago, and she claims uh, functionally, physiologically, that, um, and this is a complicated story, that um, we, we have access, I mean, but we humans have access to um, olfactory information that's not consciously registered. And let's see, the evidence was, okay, some, one sort of evidence is uh, synchronization of menstrual rhythm in women that, that, and that live together, or that camp together, or that go to the army together. People have done studies, for example, in Israel, in the, in the all Israeli women have to go two years to the army. And um, of course, you would expect women to roughly, you know, if you take two women, the chance of that they menstruate on the same day, you know, is, is what, uh, what is it, one to over 28 times the, the width of the, of the menstruation period. But the claim is that that um, that actually the the incident is much much higher. Again, that's somewhat controversial. That claim. Everything I could find out about all factions somewhat controversial. And then there was this Barbara. So the, so the claim is there that that this is based on unconscious uh, olfactory clue, clue um, cues. Although it's very difficult when you live close together with with people to rule out all sorts of other you know, verbal clues or visual clue, uh, cues or all sorts of other cues. Then there was this, um, uh, McClinton also published this uh, study, um, see what was that, where, they, where women were asked to, what was it, they smelled the, they were asked to, it was a rather bizarre study, but it, it did come out in nature, it was a, bizarre, a study where they, they were asked to choose men based on smells, what was it, they, yes, they, what, Based on the smell 
the strip. Yeah, that's right. They related it to the major histo histocompatibility complex. That's right. Yeah. Now all of this, uh, all of this is, is somewhat uh, is, is, is somewhat controversial um, um, if you look at the literature. But it's I find it rather fascinating. So it might be true that there are these olfactory uh, cues that that are unconscious, whether or not. So there's several questions here. Is this question okay? The, the, uh, to what extent is the vomonasal system in humans active? Not just the vestigial organ, organ that might be important for mice, for sex and aggression behavior, but, of, but it just might be relevant for us. That's one question. Independence of the question, to what extent is the unconscious or factory processing, particularly for things like, you know, for, again, for gender, for, for, for gender uh, sex specific behaviors. And I guess they, they might be mediated just like uh, they might be mediated by the main olfactory system, not by the vomoronasal um, olfactory system. So I mean, I know there's uh, quite a bit of research going on there, particularly, of course, by the by the perfume industry, right? Since they, they you know, if they can claim that they are that they have sex-specific um, uh, perfumes, you know, they would like that. Yeah. So they've done all these experiments where they take a random hall and they have people, you know, male or uh, females walk into it and they spray certain seeds and then they, they, you know, they 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 check are people more likely than not to go to to avoid those seeds that's been sprayed with these hormones or to go toward them and then they ask them, you know, are they, you know, do they smell them? Do they not smell them? That sort of research. It's, it's rather <laughs> amusing. Um, so let me finish. So. This, if it's true, and there does seem to be really a lot of evidence that there's, and certainly it agrees with our experience of life, that huge amount of stuff goes on in our head that we're not conscious of, and that most of the things we do, in fact, when you become older, it dawns upon you that maybe the majority of things that you do are of this unconscious nature. When you talk or walk or greet somebody in the morning, when you brush your teeth, when you drive home, all those things you can do quite sophisticated, but without probably without sort of spending too much conscious thought on it. So that raises two questions: A, if conscious is an evolved property of the of, of the brain, what, 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 why do you need it? Why do you need consciousness at all? If you have all these unconscious systems and they do all these things so wonderfully, why do you need consciousness? I'm not going to answer it, but that's. Uh, why, why, why doesn't the brain consist of a large collection of these unconscious systems if they're so great? And second of all, you have to ask at the neuronal question, where's the difference? Where's the difference between all those skills and behaviors and procedures that can go on without consci consciousness to those that involve consciousness? Is it uh, different neurons, like for example, Milner and Goodell say that one is ventral, one is dorsal, there's just something special about the dorsal passage that's not found in the ventral? Um, it doesn't have to do something with the complexity of the associated brain circuits. Does it, it, it's a different type of firing, like oscillation versus not oscillation. People have speculated on all of these things. Whatever it is, one thing we do we do know it appears to exist, and we'll talk more about it in the second last lecture of the series, uh, based on split brain experiments. Whatever it is, it seems to be found in both hemispheres. It's one of the few things we really know for for sure. Whatever the mechanism is, it appears to exist independently in split brain people, and to a certain extent. Uh, possibly independent normal people. Now, my favorite hypothesis here is that the difference probably relates to the fact feed forward versus feed back. That, and we sort of touched upon this theme when we talked about masking, that um, w every time you have uh, just feed forward activity running through, racing through a system, or primarily feed forward uh, activity running through a system, as, as I showed you, as I hope to, demonstrate, to have demonstrated to you in the lecture last week, with this uh, ultra-rapid recognition, right, where you can flash up images 150 milliseconds later, something in your brain knows it's an animal or it co doesn't contain an animal. That given the, those sh short times involved, that probably only involves feed-forward activity. And that uh, d uh, uh, does not involve uh, uh, conscious perception. The conscious perception has to involve massive feedback back to the system. There has to be some sort of reverberatory activity that builds up maybe for a couple of hundred milliseconds, and that is not possible without feedback activity. So therefore, the prediction would be that in any system you can, or anywhere in the brain, you can get sort of these zombie behaviors if it's just based on feed-forward activity or primarily feed-forward activity. That, of course, can be very fast because you don't need to wait to do endless cycling. You just you have one sweep through the system, right? You go from the motor, from from your your retina to V1 to let's see, I don't know, motor cortex, the basal ganglion, and you go out, bang, 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 and you you know, and you move your thing, you move your finger, whatever. 
but that uh, if it evolves uh, uh, consciousness, you know, you have to reflect upon, you have to access planning stages, you have to put in shorter memory, all that involves uh, uh, feedback circuits. Um, and so the critical, one, one critical difference would therefore be uh, in the nature of a circuit that one is feed forward, then it's unconscious in, from a point when it involves feedback, a massive amount of feedback, it might give rise to conscious sensation. Right now we just don't know, but those are some of the speculations. And I'm leaving you with that. So on Friday we'll talk about uh, uh, night walking, I mean sleepwalking, partial complex seizures, all sorts of interesting behaviors in patients. <laughs>